I am here with Marty Ship, uh, who is not only an actor, he's also a professor, a help uh, builder of children's entertainment with Nickelodeon, <laughs> uh, director, uh, many other things. Uh, but he can do a lot better job of telling you about himself than I could. Uh, Marty, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, it's uh, it's hard to sum up 40 years <laughs> in uh, uh, in a Zoom call, but. Um, I've, I've done just about everything you can think of uh, in film, television, and theater. I actually uh, started working in regional theaters in Pittsburgh back in the uh, 60s and 70s um, because there wasn't film. Um, I, my goal was always to get into film and television. But back in those days, you didn't have film schools and the ability to shoot things on a, on a phone uh, like you can today. I mean, you just didn't have the accessibility to it. Probably by the time I was 20, I had been involved in about 60 plays. And about that time, uh, I was a junior at Point Park. Uh, I was a theater major there. And George Romero was shooting Dawn of the Dead uh, up at the Monroeville Mall and all over Pittsburgh. And they came to Point Park to see if they had, anybody wanted to be a, a stunt zombie. And I thought, well, this is my chance. So I jumped up thinking everybody in the class was going to jump up and volunteer. And I was the only one standing. So um, it's a, it's actually a pretty infamous bit uh, where Tom Savini gets hit by a truck and he lands on myself and John Hall, another uh, student from Point Park, actually. Uh, we're the two zombies that catch Tom, you know. So um, I started out as a stunt mat, basically. But the bit is famous because if you slow down your DVD, you couldn't do it on a VHS. Um, if you slow down your DVD, you can actually see the mini tramp, the blue mini tramp that Tom jumps off of when he, he takes the hit from the truck. And uh, George liked the way that uh, everything went that day. And he asked me if I wanted to get hit by a sledgehammer and thrown into a garbage can and uh, for 25 bucks at the Monroeville Mall. So he told me to come to the mall the, that following Saturday, actually. And um, Tasso, who plays Sledge in the movie, uh, Tasso and I actually went to high school together. We knew each other very well. And we did a bit where he hits me with the sledgehammer and I go flying into a garbage can and, and that's it. Well, that same night, was the first night the bikers were in the movie and they needed some actors to sort of round out the uh, the bikers. And I was just at the right place at the right time. And that was really where it all started, was right there. And I ended up working another 25, 30 days on Dawn of the Dead. Uh, became good friends with, with George, became very good friends with Tom Savini. Um, you know, so that was really what I consider the start of my career in film and television was, uh, was Dawn of the Dead. Then I went on, I, I went to Point Park, when I graduated from Point Park, I moved out to Hollywood and um, did a couple more films with George. I did Night Riders and Creepshow and then um, started working in television. Uh, 1982, I had my first series, which was called The Book of Lists with Bill Bixby. And uh, don't worry if you've never heard of it, nobody did. It lasted for four weeks and we were canceled, you know. But it got me started in television, and uh, and then I worked for the next 15 years steady uh, in TV. Did a lot of commercials. If you Google uh, on YouTube, if you do a search for, uh, I think it's 90s arm wrestling Little Caesars Pizza. Uh, there's a spot of me that I did for Little Caesars on there. I did a lot of national commercials and had a very good run of it out there. Um, 1994, Northridge earthquake hits. We lose everything in that earthquake. I finally just moved back to Pittsburgh. I threw in the towel and came back. And at that time, the whole sort of digital revolution was starting to happen. And um, I started getting involved in it very early. My brother and I went out and bought a couple of XL1s and started Shift Media. So I got into producing and directing a lot more at that point and sort of put acting on the back burner. Um, and that whole thing, the Shift Media inspired uh, uh, a project with Savini and I, with Tom Savini and I, called House Call, written by Jeff Monahan, uh, and was part of Tom Savini's Chill Factor, um, which I, I think it's on, uh, it actually got incorporated into George Romero's Dead Time Stories that I produced. 
and um, and so you know sort of been producing and directing more since I've been back and um, got, I always wanted to teach I owned an acting school in LA I owned the LA Film Actors Lab and I, I sort of brushed over 16 and a half years in LA there was a lot that happened there and one of the things was I uh, owned the LA Film Actors Lab and we we trained a lot of the young actors that you know today, like Matt Perry, uh, Justin, uh, Justine and Jason Bateman were there. I always enjoyed teaching. And so uh, a few years ago, I started teaching uh, at Point Park as a guest artist. Well, in order to be considered a serious professor in academia, you have to have that master's. So at the age of 60, I went back to school and I got my MFA in writing for film and television. And uh, so now I'm a full-time professor at the University of Cincinnati, and I teach uh, an adjunct course at Point Park. So um, pretty much that brings you up to speed. That's the the entire Marty Schiff story right there. I'd say so. Um, so yeah, it's funny that you uh, mentioned working with him because that leads into my next question. Um, what was it like having such a long collaborative relationship with um, obviously, you know, me being from uh, the Pittsburgh area, like George Romero and Tom Savini, like are, you know, icons here. Um, you know, what's it like working so so many, not years, but decades with, with those with those two gentlemen? It's, it's really pretty amazing. Um, George, uh, he really put together a family, you know, there, there's a family of us. And whenever we see each other, it doesn't matter when we see each other, uh, you know, it, it's always very much like a homecoming. I probably talk to Tom more than anybody, of course, but, um, you know, it's, it's unlike any other experience I ever had, because usually when you get into a, a film or a TV show, when it's over, it's over. You know, you may have one or two friends that you stay in touch with and social media has made that a lot easier of course but it's nothing like the Romero family um, you know I can run into Nikki Tallow or Joe Shelby or um, any of those people that were in Dawn of the Dead you know all those years ago and there's still a great deal of love and caring and affection for each other um, it's really unique and I was fortunate to have uh, gotten close to George and uh, and you know been called him a friend as well as a you know um, a director um, and you know very sad that he that he passed when he passed uh, fortunately I got to see him before um, not too long before but um, you know it's it's really unique it, it's really a wonderful thing. Um, and one of my all-time favorite films is uh, Creep Show. And uh, what was it like, you know, shooting on on that type of anthology film? Well, you know, Creep Show was really the first time that that uh, we got to work with a bunch of name actors. You know, Hal Holbrook, Fritz Weaver, Adrian Barbeau, E.G. Marshall. I mean, these were these were people that we you know grew up watching and sort of respecting as actors. Uh, and then you had some newcomers too that went on to great things like Ted Danson. Uh, you know, this was year, he, Creepshow was years before Cheers. And then Ed Harris, of course, you know, Ed had uh, starred in Knight Riders the summer before. Uh, we did Knight Riders in 80 and Creepshow in 81. Uh, and Ed's in Creepshow and, and Ed's career was just starting to ramp up at that point. So, you know, you, you had the opportunity to work with some really quality people and, um, and it was fun. It was just really a lot of fun. I mean, it was a lot of work. So I acted in the movie, but I also was a grip on the film. If you ever look at the credits, you'll see Moon Baby Shift under the electric screw, under the grip groove, and that's me. Um, I did a lot of the, almost all of the light changes in the film. Uh, when you see the colors change behind the actors to give it that color book effect, yeah. That's me running two light boards, basically, two dimmer boards. And Nikki Mistandria, who was the key grip for George um, on most of his projects, his earlier projects, uh, knew that I had a background in lighting in theater and had spoken to me about uh, working the dimmer boards for Creep Show. And that's how I ended up becoming the grip for the show and, and, and actually doing all those, those wonderful lighting things, which was really fun. Now, you had continuing uh roles on Out of Control in Dallas. Is there a major difference between acting for TV as compared to film? Oh, yeah. I mean, 
in film, and the biggest thing is time uh, and money. Um, so on a movie, you work to get two minutes of usable footage a day, two to three minutes of usable footage a day. If you get five, you're really lucky. You know, if you get five minutes of usable film. And that's why movies take anywhere from, you know, five weeks to six months to get done is because you work in sort of the micro. In television, you work a lot faster. In uh, one hour TV, you try to get 10 minutes of usable footage every day. Um, and uh, for three camera, you're doing it like a little play. You're running the show in a half an hour, you're done. Um, and you have, you know, three camera, which is really four cameras, but you know, you have a, a multiple camera set. Um, you know, if you're doing a sitcom uh, back in the day, most sitcoms were multiple camera uh, and those go much quicker. They go a lot faster. Um, and the scripts are smaller. You know, a feature can be 90 to 120 pages, whereas a television show back in the day uh, for half an hour was 26 to 30 and for an hour was anywhere from, you know, 50 to, to 60 pages long. So much more condensed for television. You're working at a much faster pace. Now you directed The Odds. Um, how did you like directing and, uh, and how does it compare to being in front of the camera? Well, um, I, I love directing, I really do. Um, it's a lot different because you're, you know, when you're an actor, you're in your own head, you're focusing on your lines, you're, you know, you've got so much going on inside your head that you're worried about. As a director, you're watching every little thing. You're watching, you know, you're taking in the big picture. Um, and, uh, and really, you're, shaping how the thing's gonna work out. The Odds was really, really fun because um, it was a multi-camera show uh, and uh, it was a pilot and it was um, it was really a good time. I loved directing it. And um, I chose to be on the floor instead of in the booth. And when you direct multi-camera, um, you can be either place. You could be in the booth with the crew or you can be out on the floor. And I chose to be out on the floor with my cast, you know. Um, and it was really, it was really fun. It was, a, it was a good time. I loved it. Most people aren't aware of this, but you helped put Nickelodeon on the map and kind of, uh, for people of my generation, kind of uh, set the stage for what Nickelodeon would be um, for all of us. Uh, can you talk about Out of Control and what the whole process of working with Nickelodeon was like? Um, we were uh, the first show produced for Nickelodeon, specifically uh, for Nickelodeon by Nickelodeon. So there was there was other shows uh, prior to us, but they were um, produced for other networks, or they were part of Pinwheel, which was a um, a children's block of programming out of Ohio, uh, out of Columbus, actually. Uh, Pinwheel was actually the genesis for Nickelodeon. And we were sort of a gamble for them um, because they had never invested uh, into their own programming like they did until Out of Control. And, um, and it was really kind of neat. Um, we didn't know at the time that cable and satellite was going to become what it was. My agent uh, actually apologized to me because he was sending me out for a cable, in a, you know, cable audition. And, uh, and I said to him, I said, cable, really cable? I said, what's next birthday clown? I said, come on, Martin, you got to step it up, you know? And of course it turned out to be Nickelodeon, you know, who, who you never knew, you didn't know. In 1984, you had no idea what it was all going to become. And of course, uh, Dave Coulier, who was just a, a young stand up comedian, um at the time was the host of the show and dave and i hit it off we still talk uh, on a regular basis um dave was hilarious it was the most fun i ever had going to work you know i would wake up at like three in the morning laughing and my girlfriend would say what is your problem and i would say well dave did something on the set you know that was funny so it was just really fun and i couldn't wait to get on the set and it was gorilla television you know and it was sort of in a way very similar to working with george because george was a guerrilla filmmaker you know you're running gun you get in there you get it done you get out 
And that's what working uh, for Nickelodeon back in those days was like. It was very low budget. It was very, um, you know, we were thinking on our feet constantly. You can Google uh, Out of Control on uh, on YouTube as well. I think there's uh, 12 or 14 episodes on there. Um, and you can see where, you know, we were sort of out there making it up as we go. In a lot of the remote episodes, or the remote segments in the episodes, really were ad-libbed and, and improv by us, the actors that were in it, you know. Um, so it was just really fun, and it was just this creative high, you know, that was amazing, and it was great. The show uh, only was, um, we only did enough, back then a series, or a, a season was 13 episodes. We only did, uh, excuse me, we only did enough episodes for two seasons. We did 26 episodes. Nickelodeon re-ran it for nine years. And there was no residuals for cable back in those days, you know. Mm -hmm. So my children have to refer to Nickelodeon as the network that daddy built, you know. So it's just, um, but it was great, you know, it was really fun to be part of it. Jerry Laybourne had taken over Nickelodeon while we were doing Out of Control. And her philosophy was different uh, than the previous uh, uh, management team. Um, and Jerry wanted it to make it more uh, kids for kids. So, you know, you could definitely see a line from where uh, you, can, you can't do that on television sort of took over because they had children as performers in the show, as opposed to out of control. We rarely, you know, we, we occasionally had children as guests on the show, but mostly it was, you know, the five principals that were adults. Jerry's vision was, you know, she wanted to see more children's programming be by children, you know, with children involved. So you can definitely, that's where, you know, most people mistake us a lot of times for the, you, you can't do that on television, which was out of Canada before Nickelodeon took it over. And one of the things that made that so strong on the network and, and such a force was it fit the profile that they were sort of going for. We were still sort of the the naughty kids network, you know, we had slime and we had, you know, um, we were sort of what what Disney wasn't, you know, we were for the we were for the the sort of, you know, the kids that had a naughtier imagination, you know, so. Um, <laughs> But, and that was part of the fun too, was it was, uh, it was really kind of fun because we broke some rules, you know, we, we didn't necessarily always play it by the way. The whole slime thing, you know, I'm sure parents were cringing at that as they let their children watch us on, on TV. And we actually did the very first sliming, I think on, out of, on Nickelodeon, and it was actually mustard. We were making a giant hot dog and uh, Wake, uh, Jill Wakewood, uh, Wakewood gets hit with, uh, mustard <laughs> so <laughs> it's better than what i've heard it was later used like soap and stuff and it i don't know <laughs> yeah network. well uh, the mustard wasn't all that great either to tell you the truth <laughs> uh now you were obviously much more than this but you know this episode is coming out in like around you know september october that era, you know and for me i'm kind of obsessive about halloween so september early september to early november is you know uh where i'm kind of where i shine um now you you are part of the horror landscape you know dawn of the dead effects creep show dead time stories just to name a few like yep. um how does it feel to be kind of uh you know just a part of that that legacy of you know films and things that really played that this time of year it's pretty cool and when we were doing it back in the day you had no idea you know I had no idea that 40 years later, people would still be excited about Dawn of the Dead. You know, we were basically just running around a mall killing zombies. You know, we had no idea that number one, it would really launch, Dawn of the Dead really launched the zombie genre, you know. Uh, Night of the Living Dead kind of started it off, but Dawn of the Dead is what really locked the genre in. You know? um, and you have no idea when you're in the middle of it, just like out of control. We had no idea while we were shooting it that Nickelodeon and cable television as a whole was going to get as big as it got, you know. Um, and then to be involved with uh, Creepshow, uh, and I think Dawn and Creepshow are, are two horror icons, you know. Th these are the things that horror fans today, these two movies, people still watch these movies on a regular basis and love them. You know, they, they still 
get a lot of respect and they get a lot of uh, appreciation. Um, when I do a convention and I have someone bringing up their their grandchildren and actually at one point great grandchild uh, at a convention to meet me, you know, we're talking four generations, three, four generations of people that have been watching this content and still love it today. Uh, it's very cool to be part of that. And um, and I, you know, I love the fans. I love that uh, they're still out there supporting us. And I think that um, it's actually pretty cool. I've been very fortunate to be part of that whole scene. I love it. And as a actor, director, producer, you name it, um, Renaissance man in this business, um, everything's been kind of shut down for everybody because of COVID. What what has the uh, the last uh, basically six months? What is that? Uh, what's that been like for you here? Well, um, I'm very fortunate to be able to teach online, which is great. Um, I'm a little concerned about what's going to happen to universities as they open up uh, in the coming weeks, you know. But um, I, I love teaching. I love giving it to the next generation and, you know, handing them the torch and letting them take it, take it and run with it. Uh, so for me, um, preparing online courses and curriculum and things has been has kept me pretty busy but uh that being said i'm also working on a, a feature um that i can't really talk too much about right now but um it is scheduled to be shooting in georgia next may uh i'll be producing uh also from nickelodeon mike gassaway who directed jimmy neutrons all the a lot of the jimmy neutrons most of them, uh, will be directing um, and we're very close to uh, getting that all buttoned up. And so I have been working on that project. Plus, I still have projects of my own that I'm, you know, working on as well. So I've been able to find ways to keep myself busy. I'm surprisingly, you know, because I always thought this, that I was this uber extrovert, you know. Um, but I've been pretty locked down just because of some underlying health issues that I've had in my life. Uh, I've stayed pretty well secluded and um, handling it, handling it surprisingly well. So, I, you know, yeah. I'm doing fine. Well, hey, let me know if you need a PA on any of those. I will, I definitely <laughs> will. And, and, and if, if you let me, I'll come back and talk about it once it's, you know, a full go, I'll, we'll talk more about that. Yes, absolutely, 100%. Um, and just to kind of wrap things up here on this conversation, um, uh, I'll admit kind of a, a big question here, but what would you what would you like your legacy to be known in this kind of crazy world of, of show business? Um, that I always showed up, I always knew my lines, and I always had fun. I mean, those are the three things that I, I think as an actor I want to be known as. And as a producer, just that uh, my content had value. You know, the stuff that I produced said value. And to me, that's what's important is that my audience enjoys what we do and what we produce has value. And those are the important things to me. And I don't necessarily mean monetarily, you know, um, but just that people can appreciate the effort and the work that, that was put into a project. That's what I want my legacy is, you know. Gotcha. Well, you know, Marty, I can't thank you enough. I really appreciate you taking some time out here um, to, to talk with me about show and dawn of the dead and everything in between <laughs> um i uh, really appreciate it and uh thank you so much my pleasure john and thank you for having me. of course <laughs>